Have you ever made a tremendous effort at accomplishing something? Maybe you invested a lot of time in it, and then at the very last moment, you ruined the whole thing. The following is from an article in the Daily Dot from March 2013 by Michelle Jaworski. The article is entitled, Basketball Player Makes Game-Winning Shot for the Other Team. Jaworski writes, an Oklahoma high school basketball state playoff quarterfinal matchup, that's a mouthful, between Hugo High School and Millwood High School ended in an upset on Thursday night. Millwood High won the game against Hugo High 38-37 with one final layup as the clock ran out. However, in a cruel twist of fate that's the subject of many athletes' worst nightmares, the final points came not from Millwood, but from a Hugo player. The article goes on to tell how, with just 2.9 seconds left on the clock, Hugo junior guard Trey Johnson received the ball and shot a layup on what he thought was his team's basket. He made the layup, but in the excitement and confusion, he had made the layup at the Millwood team's basket. The buzzer instantly marked the end of the game, and the crowd momentarily went silent. Then the Millwood fans started celebrating Johnson's layup, which had secured the victory for Millwood and ended the season for Hugo High School. Even worse for Trey Johnson, someone immortalized his final shot by uploading a video of it to YouTube. It's a video that's 40 seconds long, and it's called Kid Scores for Wrong Team at the Buzzer to Lose the Game. In 1 Corinthians 15, verses 12 through 19, the Apostle Paul spoke of the futility of living for Christ if Christ has not been raised from the dead. He said, if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God, for we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But he did not raise him, raise him if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ, those who've passed on, those who've died, are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. Darnell Shanklin, the coach for Hugo High School, told a reporter for the Oklahoman, Without a doubt, that's the toughest locker room I've ever had to talk to. He expressed sympathy for Trey Johnson, noting that the young man felt terrible about the ordeal. I'm sure that he did. Jesus spoke about many who will feel terrible on the final day when they realize they put forth a lot of effort in misguided religious endeavors. Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 through 23. Jesus says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. People do this all the time. Through much effort, they may finally hit what they've been aiming at only to realize they've been aiming at the wrong thing. Exclusivity is very much a part of Christ and his teachings. When God provided the Savior, for example, he provided only one. John 14, verse 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Through Jesus Christ and Him only, by believing and obeying His teaching only, can salvation be hoped for by anyone. In Acts chapter 4, verse 12, the Apostle Peter said, Salvation is found in no one else, 
For there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. There is no other way of salvation. We're going to look at four reasons why so many will miss salvation even while they may be making efforts to secure it. Few will be saved because so many are unwilling to find salvation by the narrow gate. In Luke chapter 13, verses 23 and 24, we're told that someone said to Jesus, Lord, are there few who will be saved? And Jesus said to them, Strive to enter the narrow gate. Strive to enter through the narrow gate. For many, I say to you, will seek to enter and will not be able. While most people feel safe, Jesus says the reality is much different. Strive to enter through the narrow gate. The word narrow means difficult, pressurized, restricted on both sides. Jesus says that many will seek to enter. Many will seek but will not be able to enter through the narrow gate. Will not be able is from a word meaning will not have the strength. A lot of people want to know how to do something, but often when they learn the answer, they either don't like the answer or they're not willing, they don't have the strength of character to do what is required in order to be successful. Again, Jesus said, strive to enter through the narrow gate. For many, I say to you, will seek to enter and will not be able. The word translated strive is the word from which we get the word agonize. It means to labor fervently. Many will seek, but few will strive to enter in. Many will fall short of salvation because they've not, they've not abandoned reliance upon themselves. It is widely believed that all good moral people will be saved. Well, if one can be saved by their own morality, if salvation can be earned by one's goodness, if one can be saved by simply being a good moral person, Jesus died for nothing. Salvation is by grace. Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Grace means unearned favor or undeserved favor. No one has ever earned salvation. No one has ever deserved salvation. However, this does not mean that you don't have to live for Christ. We read in Ephesians 2 verse 10 just a moment ago that we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Jesus said in Luke 6, verse 46, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things which I say? Those who claim salvation because of their morality are trusting in themselves. Since they rely on themselves, they reject the Savior. No one will make it to heaven because of how good they've been. Those who make it to heaven will do so because they are forgiven by the blood of Christ. Reliance on self is illustrated by a parable Jesus told in Luke 18, verses 9 through 14. We read there, To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down to on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, robbers, evil lures, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Jesus did not challenge the truthfulness of either man's declaration. The Pharisee very likely was all that he proclaimed to be. The problem was his attitude. The problem was his self-righteousness, that he was glorying in himself. 
His self-confidence arose by comparing himself to others. If we feel warmly wonderful about ourselves, and if we are outraged at the ungodliness of others, we are no better than they are. We're just more self-righteous than they may be. The reason the tax collector went home justified is not because he didn't do any bad things like other people. It's not because he did everything just right. It's because he humbled himself and put his trust in God. He sought God's mercy. The tax collector was relying upon God, not upon himself. Many will not be saved because they seek salvation while they do not forsake their sins. John the baptizer began the work of preparing for Christ. In Matthew 3 verses 1 and 2 we read, In those days John the baptizer came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. In Matthew chapter 4 verse 17 we're told that Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. On the day of Pentecost, the apostles began preaching the gospel for all the world. At the conclusion of Peter's sermon, in chapter 2, verse 38, Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. Why such emphasis upon repentance? Repentance means to have a change of heart or a change of mind. What man needs is to change his mind change his heart about sin, about living for himself. He must give up his self-will for God's will. Most people simply aren't willing to do that. This is why only few will strive to enter the narrow gate. When it becomes clear that they're going to have to give up their sins, when it becomes clear that they're going to have to give up the things they hold dearly, the things that are first in their hearts, many reject the message they turn away from Christ. Jesus described this in the parable of the sower. In Luke chapter 8, verses 13 and 14, he said, The seed that fell on the rock are those who, when they hear, receive the word with joy, and these have no root. They believe for a while, and in time of temptation, they fall away. Now the ones that fell among thorns are those who, when they've heard, go out and are choked with cares, riches, and pleasures of life, and bring no fruit to maturity. Some find all sorts of justification for their situation, for continuing in what they're doing. I don't see anything wrong with it. Everybody else is doing it. I think God just wants us to be happy. And the list goes on. Other people may become angry with the message, but it's simply impossible to justify living a sinful life while claiming salvation. Jesus said in John chapter 14, verse 15, If you love me, keep my commandments. Jesus said that. I I may have said John. John said in 1 John chapter 2, verses 3 through 6, We know that we have come to know him if we keep his commands. Whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he says, or what he commands, is a liar, and the truth is not in that person. But if anyone obeys his word, Love for God is truly made complete in them. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. And many will not be saved because they are following religious teachings that are not authorized by Christ. We read this a few moments ago. Speaking of the day of judgment in Matthew 7 verses 21 through 23, Jesus said, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Those who believe that anything done sincerely in religion is acceptable often try to make this apply to hypocrites only. But there's no indication that any of these claims were unreal or insincere. If these people were not rejected because they were hypocrites, then why were they rejected? Well, the text tells us Jesus himself says they were rejected because they were workers of lawlessness. They were trying to please God by doing things religiously 
for which they had no authority from God. In Matthew 15, verses 7 through 9, speaking of the religious leaders of his day, Jesus said, Hypocrites, well does Isaiah prophesy about you, saying, These people draw near to me with their mouth. They honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Thousands sincerely think they are serving Christ, but their beliefs are not based on Christ's teachings in the New Testament. What are you aiming at? Are you aiming at heaven? If so, it's not, it's not enough to simply call Jesus your Lord. Remember what Jesus said in Luke 6.46, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things that I say? Jesus said in John 14.15, If you love me, keep my commandments. And in Matthew 7.21, Jesus said, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. In the first recorded gospel sermon preached after Jesus had been raised and ascended to the Father, when the crowd heard and believed this gospel message, they asked Peter what they must do to be saved. They would heard, they believed, now they wanted to know what they needed to do. Peter's answer, Peter being inspired by the Holy Spirit, Peter's answer was repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And that's the same answer for today.